Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Monday, November 20th, 2023. U.S. Court of Appeals hearing on whether there should be a gag order on former President Donald Trump in his criminal case on charges he tried to overturn the 2020 presidential election and instigated the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. His lawyer argued a gag order violates his right to free speech, especially since he is a presidential candidate for 2024. Government Special Counsel's office said without a gag order, court personnel and witnesses could be in danger. Today is President Joe Biden's birthday. He is 81 years old. He makes a few jokes about his age. And the White House press secretary then gets the serious questions about whether that age matters in the president's re-election campaign. This holiday season could set records for the number of Americans traveling. The Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg joins the FAA Administrator Michael Whitaker to talk about what to expect if you are flying. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin makes an unannounced trip to Ukraine in a show of support as the U.S. Congress is considering President Biden's request for $60 billion in additional aid for Ukraine to continue its war against Russia. White House spokesperson John Kirby is asked about protesters against President Biden's policy on the war between Israel and Hamas, giving the president the nickname Genocide Joe. Plus, President Biden does the traditional Thanksgiving turkey pardon. First Lady Jill Biden welcomes the White House Christmas tree and remembering former First Lady Rosalind Carter, who died over the weekend at the age of 96. From the Associated Press, a federal appeals court appeared inclined Monday to reimpose at least some restrictions on Donald Trump's speech in his landmark election subversion case. But the judges wrestled with how to craft a gag order that doesn't infringe on the former president's free speech rights or prevent him from defending himself on the campaign trail. The three judges on the panel asked skeptical and at times aggressive questions of attorneys on both sides while weighing whether to put back in place an order from a trial judge that barred Donald Trump from inflammatory comments against prosecutors, potential witnesses, and court staff. The judges raised a litany of hypothetical scenarios that could arise in the months ahead as they considered how to fashion a balance between an order that protects Donald Trump's free amendment rights and the need to protect the criminal trial process and its integrity and its truth-finding function. That's how Associated Press summarized today's hearing. Here is D. John Sauer, President Trump's attorney. Gag order in this case installs a single federal district judge as a filter for core political speech between a leading presidential candidate and virtually every American voter in the United States at the very height of a presidential campaign. The order is unprecedented, and it sets a terrible precedent for future restrictions on core political speech. The Supreme Court said in Republican Party of Minnesota against White that we have, quote, never allowed the government to prohibit candidates from communicating relevant information to voters, and it's not the role of the government to dictate what is what topics are appropriate or uh, uh, necessary to discuss in the context of a political campaign. The gag order does both of those things. Cases involving gag orders imposed on criminal defendants or political candidates, the Brown and Ford decisions, have both given, in the words of Brown, the candidate, quote, absolute freedom, virtually unrestricted ability to comment on both the case in front of him and make a, a, a public statements that relate to his campaign as it relates to the case. So this is a radical departure from the only cases that have considered this particular uh, form of restriction, a restriction on a criminal defendant who is also campaigning for public office, and it does so in the context of a hotly contested campaign for the highest office in the United States of America. D. John Sauer, an attorney for former President Donald Trump, and as he noted, now a Republican presidential candidate. The government's special counsel office asked for the gag order in this case by arguing that Donald Trump posted a public threat on social media three days after his indictment. It read, if you go after me, I'm coming after you, in all caps. After D. John Sauer's opening statement, Judges Bradley Garcia and Patricia Millett asked him about dealing with threats and potential violence that might result before that materializes. You're certainly correct that most of the threats at issue, this pattern of statements followed by threats, is from 2020. But I think the link might be, and I wonder what your response is, that that was all about the same subject matter of this case. So essentially what the district court is finding is we have a past pattern when the defendant speaks on this subject, threats follow. And now he's making similar statements again. We're months out from the trial. This is 
predictably going to intensify as well as the threats. And so why isn't the district court justified in taking a proactive measure, not waiting for more and more threats to actually occur and stepping in to protect the integrity of the trial? There's an evidentiary burden here. The evidence, actually, it isn't just that there's no evidence now, it's that the evidence we have now completely counteracts that inference because it is undisputed that President Trump has been posting about this case almost incessantly since the day it was filed, and they haven't come forward with a single threat that's even arguably inspired by any of his his social media posts. The only threat they talk about in their brief is from the Shry decision, from the or the Shry case from the Southern District of Texas. I strongly invite the court. Well, counsel, and a death threat to the district court the judge in this case. Right, Abigail Joe right. Shry. That is the August 5th telephone call. If you pull, it's Southern District of Texas. The day it, after he said, if you come after me, I'm coming after you, that threat issued. I, I strongly encourage the court to pull both the probable cause statement and the detention order from that case where there's evidence that that particular threatener, there's no evidence of any reading of social media, that particular threatener is a unemployed, you know, mentally unstable, heavy alcoholic who sits on her couch drinking beer all day, according to her father, never leaves the apartment, watches the news, not reads things on social media, watches the news on TV, gets angry about it, and makes angry, threatening calls. So I'm sorry, Counsel, apartment. this might have been partly my fault, but I just, I want to go back. Imagine all we had was the 2020 pattern. That evidence is very specific. It's about when the president speaks on this issue, events around January 6th, and that there are very specific threats that people uh, uh, receive. And again, that was a time where, as you're saying, the atmosphere was very tense. As this trial approaches, the atmosphere is going to be increasingly tense. Why does the district court have to wait and see and wait for the threats to come? rather than taking a, a reasonable action in advance. Again, the standard is imminently impending, solidity of evidence. We have an inference from stuff that happened three years ago, countervailed, you know, contradicted by the evidence we actually have here, which is wall to wall. I mean, they are saying, oh, it's an imminent threat let, let me that someone you, could be harassed. And it, it let me happen. ask you. A portion of today's hearing, U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, you heard from Judges Bradley Garcia and some of Patricia Millette, and attorney for President Donald Trump, D. John Sauer. The attorney for the government, Cecil Vanderveden, Justice Department Assistant Special Counsel, got questions from those two judges as well, Bradley Garcia and Patricia Mollett. In discussing what is unique about this evidentiary record, can you please respond to the argument that at least most of what's being relied on here is from 2020 and the fact that in opposing counsel's view, there's been a lot of intense media attention and relatively fewer threats. So I just would like to hear what the, the strongest points you think are in response to that argument. Yes, Your Honor. So I think it's important to look at two aspects of the record that was before the district court. The first is uh, the fact that, to my knowledge, there has never been a criminal case, and the defendant certainly has not identified one, in which the defendant has routinely, I believe his word was incessantly, taken to uh, public uh, uh, posting to a national audience to routinely uh, vilify the prosecutors as as thugs, as deranged, as lunatics, to malign the court as fraud and hack, uh, and to attack witnesses uh, based on their credibility and the substance of their anticipated testimony, calling them liars, cowards, uh, weak, saying one deserves the punishment of death. That alone, I think, would be sufficient for the for the district court to act. But you combine that with a, a, a record going back a number of years, but continuing to this day, in which numerous people have been targeted as a result of uh, the defendant's posts. And I think there are 16 different people that are documented in the record. Eight of them are from the 2020-2021 period, which I believe Judge Garcia, as you noted, is hardly um, some tangential time period uh, uh, to this case. This is exactly the core of what this case is all about, this period after the election. Some of those, of course, go through um, today. We talk about, of course, the, the threat to Judge Chuckin, and then um, we, we have threats to the district attorney in New York, threats to the district attorney and the sheriff of Fulton County, threats to the former president, uh, threats into the judge, judge chambers presiding over the ongoing civil trial. These are all from the last few weeks. So the, the notion that, that there was some dynamic that existed in 2020 that has since abated or gone stale, I think, is, is, is wrong. Well, how do we... Oh, is it yes. How do we know what he gets held accountable 
for. I mean, this is the Internet era. Um, he's a high profile public figure who posts uh, it's lots and lots and lots of followers. Um, but it's also covered on news channels that have listeners um, and newspapers that have readers and all manner of media can communicate his words to people of the public. How, I mean, how do we, how does a district court reasonably decide which postings he is responsible for prompting adverse conduct, you know, resulting adverse conduct, and which are, he's protesting, he's, he's, he's expressing his views as the First Amendment allows, and in a social media world cannot be held responsible for what every, everyone anywhere in the United States does when they hear about it. Uh, two answers to that, Your Honor. I think first is, is the sheer number of occurrences. So certainly if there had been one time when he posted something derogatory about a person and then at some point thereafter that person was was uh, a recipient of a, a threat, I don't think we would be here. The sheer number combined with the testimony of the people who experienced it on the on the receiving end who said what changed when the when the defendant tweeted about me was I started getting much more graphic, much more specific, much more pervasive threats. When, as one of the witnesses, a poll worker in Georgia testified to Congress. Do you have any of that with respect to his statements about this criminal trial? Uh, no, um, none of the people who have been directly threatened as a result of this criminal trial have, have testified about that exact phenomenon. Although, again, um, I think the, the context around the threat to the district court is worth emphasizing. So the indictment came down on August 1st. The uh, arraignment was on August 3rd. Before traveling to the arraignment, he uh, issued a public statement saying, unfair venue, unfair judge. Uh, the next day, he posted, if you go after me, I'm coming after you. And the day after that, the district court received the death threat. So, yes, there's a, it's a matter of uh, inference, circumstantial evidence, of course, but the district court made those findings. And to Judge Pillard's point earlier, those are findings of historical fact that should be reviewed for clear error. Cecil van de Venden is Justice Department Assistant Special Counsel being questioned by Federal Appeals Court Judges Bradley Garcia and Patricia Millett. The third judge on this three-judge panel, U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, is Cornelia Pillard. Going back to the Associated Press article on today's hearing, should the judges rule against Donald Trump, he'll have the option of asking the entire court to take up the matter. His lawyers have also signaled that they'll ask the Supreme Court to get involved. The hearing ran over two hours. We covered it all live. It's audio only. That was the only thing that was provided. But you can find it all at our website at cspan.org. Former President Donald Trump shared a post today on his Truth Social platform from Monica Crowley, who served in the Treasury Department during the Trump administration. And it reads, everything you've been told about January 6th is BS. She uses the real word. The real insurrectionists Insurrectionists are those who framed Trump to try to stop him from ever being president again and who framed you as domestic terrorists to try to crush America first. They have failed and they will pay. This is Washington Today. CNN writes that President Joe Biden is marking his 81st birthday milestone Monday with a low-key family celebration as he braces for a strenuous election year ahead. But even as the first family keeps the celebrations muted and out of sight, moment nevertheless highlights his greatest campaign liability, his advanced age, and along with it perceptions among voters that his physical and mental fitness have declined. On Monday morning, as he presided over the annual Thanksgiving turkey pardon, President Biden seemingly confused pop stars Britney Spears and Taylor Swift. That was from CNN. Also at that turkey pardon, he made a couple of jokes about his age. Here's joke number one. Thanks to the chairman of the National Turkey Federation, Steve Lichen, Steve and your entire family. I got to meet the entire family. And by the way, I, it's my birthday today, and they can actually sing birthday music. I just want you to know it's difficult turning 60. It's difficult. <laughs> and joke number two from President Biden. This is the 76th anniversary of this event. And I want you to know I wasn't there in the first one. I was too young to make it up. <laughs> Later at the White House briefing, Press Secretary Queen Jean-Pierre was asked by reporters about the president's birthday and his re-election campaign. You mentioned the president's excited to be celebrating his birthday, but I'm curious, 
David Axelrod told the New York Times, quote, Biden thinks he can cheat nature here, and it's really risky. A, what's the president's response to David Axelrod? Does he respect his opinion? Does he think he's right? But also, I mean, is there a real alarm happening behind the scenes that the president is simply too old to stake around for another four years? No, there's no alarm happening behind the scenes. Not, there, I, I can only speak sure. behind the scenes here. There's no alarm happening behind the scenes, and I'm certainly not going to uh, comment on uh, everybody who has something to say. Uh, uh, what I, I, I mean, David Axelrod well, is, I didn't, a, is, I, is. I didn't say that. I didn't. I, yeah. Nowhere in my response to you that I said that. I said I'm just not going to comment on everyone that has a, that has a comment to say. They're going to speak for themselves. I'm going to speak for the president. And here, what, I, what I'll say is, look. Um, and also, it's just not my job. It's not my job to think, to, to think through, or to um, uh, to tell people what to think, right? Whether it's an, a, the American American people out there, or uh, or a a you know political analyst, or or as your question is about David Axelrod, it's just not my 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 place to speak to that. What I can speak to is how we see this, how what our perspective is. Our perspective is that it's not about age. It's about the president's experience. That's what we believe. And it's, you know, as they say, the proof is in the pudding, right? The president has used his experience to pass more bipartisan legislation in recent time than any other president. That's just a fact. That is something that we have seen this president do, and that's because of his experience. He's been able to manage multiple uh, multiple foreign policy challenges. That's He's been able to do that. That's because of his experience. He's been able to create jobs, raise wages, and lower inflation. Right, and that is also that is the proof is in the pudding, right? We see that in the data. We see that where we are today than where we are than where we were when the president walked into the administration. So what we say is we have to judge him by what he's done, not by his numbers. And and one more thing I will add, this is the first president ever that's been able to go to an active war zone without our military, uh, you know, c controlling what's happening on the ground. And so look, um, I would put. The president's stamina, the president's wisdom, ability to get this done on behalf of, of uh, the American people against anyone, anyone on any day of the week. White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre. David Axelrod was mentioned during the question. He's a Democratic strategist, former advisor to former President Obama. He told New York Times columnist Maureen Dowd regarding President Biden's run for re-election. I think he has a 50-50 shot here, but no better than that, maybe a little worse. He thinks he can cheat nature here, and it's really risky. They've got a real problem if they're counting on Trump to win it for them. I remember Hillary doing that, too. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg says that this holiday season is expected to have some of the busiest travel days in U.S. history. In a pre-Thanksgiving news conference today at the Transportation Department, the secretary was joined by the Federal Aviation Administrator Michael Whitaker to talk about the agency's preparations. Here is Michael Whitaker. As always, the skies will be extremely busy this Thanksgiving. Um, we'll, we're expecting almost 50,000 flights on Wednesday. 49,600 is our current estimate, uh, and that eclipses last year. We will be working around the clock to make sure passengers get to their destinations safely. We are going to be uh, handling the East Coast volume by opening the holiday airspace release program and the holiday Gulf routes. This is the restricted airspace off the East Coast and in the Gulf of Mexico that the military releases to the FAA for commercial plane use. Uh, these initiatives lessen inland volume and reduce delays. We've also cleared 169 new faster routes along the East Coast to shorten flight times. And we coordinated with the commercial space industry to make sure no launches are scheduled, opening even more airspace in the days surrounding Thanksgiving. As we prepare for the upcoming <clears throat> winter weather, we have awarded over $50 million to airports around the nation for de-icing equipment to help passengers get to their destination safely. So while we don't control the weather, we're doing everything in our power to keep flights safe and keep cancellations and delays low this Thanksgiving. We want the airspace to operate as efficiently as possible, but our first mission is always safety. Last week, as you know, I received the Independent Safety Review Team's findings on aviation safety. This team of experts was convened in April as part of the call to action to examine ways 
to further enhance safety and reliability in the nation's aerospace system. We welcome the safety review team's recommendations and we're taking action on them right now. Friday, we announced several key initiatives to increase our rate of hiring and training of air traffic controllers. These include optimizing our controller academy in Oklahoma City, making sure that we fill every seat, and building satellite training facilities at our existing locations around the country for advanced controller training. We're moving to a year-round hiring track for experienced controllers, allowing veterans and other professionals to direct hire into facilities when they become available for employment. We're also trading, creating a track for direct hiring for students from aeronautical colleges and universities who complete the requisite training and pass our skills exam. This will allow successful graduates to move quickly directly into on-the-job training at facilities. And finally, we're deploying high-resolution tower simulators in 95 facilities across the country, starting with Austin in January. These initiatives are in addition to a host of other initiatives the FAA has already taken this year to improve safety. And I think all of these initiatives show that safety is a journey of continuous improvement and we will strive to continue to improve. So thank you, happy Thanksgiving, and as the Secretary uh, mentioned, if you're, tr if you're flying, please be nice to your flight crew. They're there for your safety. Thank you. FAA Administrator Michael Whitaker with Reporters Today in Washington. News Nation reports that from November 17th through the 28th, Transportation Security Administration expects to screen an unprecedented 30 million passengers. Another estimated 2.9 million passengers are anticipated to fly the Sunday after Thanksgiving as well. In total, AAA expects 4.7 million to fly to their Thanksgiving destinations this year which is 6.6% more compared to 2022 and the highest number of air travelers during the time period since 2005. That was from News Nation. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, as mentioned, was at today's news conference as well and asked about last year's travel season versus this year. What's different? Secretary, Administrator, thank you. Uh, I'm Matt Small from the Plains Guy. Um, I'm just in speaking to consumers, and this has been a big focus of yours, um, what, and last year we had well-documented issues with the way the system and the airlines performed last spring, last holiday season. What is tangibly different in your mind this year? Uh, I heard you talk about uh, private flights maybe being deprioritized. I don't know how different that is than how this worked last year. Obviously, from the DOT um, standpoint, you're making it, it seems pretty clear the implication that if airline, your representation <coughs> of airlines, if they don't meet them, there will be some consequences from the regulatory side. But what is, from a... So what do we tell consumers? What is tangibly different this year um, than last year? And is it really as simple as it depends on how cooperative Mother Nature is on whether it matters or not? Mother Nature, of course, is, is the X factor in all of this. But the biggest thing I would say is tangibly different is, is the results, right? So uh, we're seeing, in terms of cancellations, a clear improvement in the numbers that I think is related to the pressure that we have put on airlines. and. To their credit, some of the steps that they have taken, both in terms of the realism of their schedules and in terms of having the, the staffing and the preparation to, uh, uh, to, to meet the demand that's come in. And remember, this, this is happening in the context of off-the-charts demand. Right? It's, it's not as if it just happens to be a soft year, and, and that's why it's been easier to, to make those schedules. Now, uh, I don't want to paper over other issues that are there, including delays, uh, which we would like to see come further down. Uh, but something that's tangibly different really is, is in terms of the results. The other thing that's tangibly different is what happens if you wind up in one of those cancellations or delays. And just a year and a half ago, you would not have been able to uh, have the DOT enforce a right on your part to get, for example, the, the uh, meals or, or ground transportation covered. Now you can. And, and it's all, uh, I think I have a screenshot of it up here. It's been extraordinary to me to see the uh, power of this tool and how differently airlines behave when they know that passengers know what to expect. It took a matter of days from me writing to the airline CEO saying, hey, we're going to put up this website, to them changing their policies. So it's, it's, it's not just atmospheric. I mean, specific policies on the airline's part have changed, and specific policies on the federal side are changing. 
more work to do, uh, but I think there's a real tangible difference. Again, weather is what it is, but also when weather strikes, it's a sign of the health of the system how quickly it recovers. And that's true for one airline at a time, and it's true for the system as a whole. Something we'll be watching very closely, both going into any disruptions that could happen this week, and of course with the next big holiday rush coming around the winter holiday. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg at a news conference with the FAA Administrator at the Transportation Department in Washington, D.C. And for those who will be driving, AAA projects there'll be over 50 million of you. This Thanksgiving, that's an increase of 1.7 percent versus last year. Wall Street today, the Dow up 203, Nasdaq up 159, S&P up 33. Reuters reports from Kiev, Ukraine, that U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin announced $100 million in new military aid to Ukraine during an unannounced visit to Kiev on Monday, pledging long-term American support amid growing concerns about the sustainability of vital U.S. assistance. Secretary Austin announced the aid package after a day of meetings with Ukrainian officials, saying it included arms such as anti-tank weapons and air defense interceptors. Austin, accompanied by the top U.S. general in Europe, was photographed smiling and shaking hands with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. It marked Austin's first trip to Kiev since April 2022. That was from Reuters. Secretary Austin then came out and spoke with reporters. He was asked about President Biden's request to Congress for $60 billion in additional aid for Ukraine. Well, I, you know, I continue to see bipartisan support in both chambers of Congress, and I know that there are some things that we need to continue to work through uh, to to get the supplemental request uh, approved, uh, and we'll continue to work with Cong- Congress to to do that. Again, uh, Congress, uh, our congressional members have uh, have valid questions that we will answer, and uh, but again, I, I would point out that uh, Ukraine matters. What happens here matters, not just to Ukraine, but to the entire world. This is about the rules-based international order. This is about, you know, not not, not living in a world where a dictator can uh, wake up one day and decide to to annex uh, uh, the property of his peaceful neighbor. That's not the world that we want to live in. And so this is this is more than than just Ukraine. This is about, again, the rules-based international order. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in Kiev with reporters. CBS News writes that. Defense Secretary Austin's visit to Kyiv came shortly after Ukraine's military announced new advances into Russian-held ground in the east of the country. Ukrainian forces have crossed the Dnipro River in the Kyrgyzstan region and pushed two to five miles into territory that had been occupied for months by Russian troops, according to preliminary information shared by Ukrainian military spokesperson. If confirmed, it would be Ukraine's first significant military advance in months. That was from CBS News. Secretary Austin also got a question today about how to break what appears to be a general stalemate on a 600-mile-long front. I know that you and your team and your counterparts on the military side have been working really hard over the last year and a half to support Ukraine, to train their forces, to get it um, a number of different capabilities. And yet, the, the oper- offensive operations haven't had the outcome that everybody wanted. How does this deadlock on the battlefield get broken, given that you guys have give, uh, you know, given all the support that you thought you could give? Well, let's, let's take stock of what the Ukrainians have actually done. They've taken back half the, pro- half the, uh, the ground that the, the Russians originally occupied. I think that's a pretty big deal. I think if you look at what they've accomplished here at the, with the Black Sea Fleet, uh, they have inflicted significant pain on, uh, on that fleet and actually caused them uh, to reposition a bit. Uh, if you look at the, the damage that they've created to Russians' uh, uh, land forces overall, it's significant. And it will take Russia uh, quite a while to, to recover from that and to, in order to create the kinds of force that it, that it had uh, uh, before this began. So we have to give credit what credit is due. I mean, this is, we said it was going to be a tough fight. It's a, it's a grinding fight, and I think we'll continue to see that in the future. Now, uh, what's important as you pointed out in your earlier part of the question, uh, is that they learn from, uh, from, you know, operations in the past and that they make the right adjustments and that, uh, and that they anticipate that the enemy will also adjust as they are adjusting. So. 
Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin with reporters in Kyiv, Ukraine. Now to Israel's war with Hamas. This is from the Times of Israel. White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby says we're closer now to a hostage deal than we've been before with regard to reaching a deal to secure the release of some 240 hostages of all ages from Gaza. John Kirby declined to elaborate any further regarding the details. U.S. President Joe Biden affirmed earlier in the day that he believes the deal is closer than had been possible previously as well. That was from the Times of Israel. Here's John Kirby in the White House briefing room. I just want to let you know we're still working this hour by hour. I do not have an update for you on the hostage uh, uh, deal that we're trying to negotiate. Uh, But as you heard the Deputy National Security Advisor say yesterday, uh, we believe we're closer than we've ever been. So we're hopeful. Uh, but, uh, but there's still work to be done, um, uh, and nothing is done until it's all done. So uh, we're, we're going to keep working on this. John Kirby is Strategic Communications Coordinator for the White House National Security Council in the White House briefing room. During the Q&A portion with reporters, he was asked about protesters in the U.S. opposed to President Biden's policies on the Israel-Hamas war, giving the president a negative nickname. Protesters here in D.C. and New York across the country Uh, They've settled on a nickname for the president. Uh, They've been calling him Genocide Joe. They wrote it on the gates. Um, Do you have a response from the White House to that nickname that they've settled on? We're not worried about nicknames and bumper stickers. I mean, uh, it's First Amendment, free speech. Um, uh, The president's focused on, as he wrote in his op-ed, on making sure that we can continue to support Israel as they fight a terrible terrorist group, Hamas, Um, And as we all work together to get humanitarian assistance in and get people out, including hostages. Um, I I said this the other day. Again, people can say what they want on on the sidewalk, and and we respect that. That's what the First Amendment's about. But this word genocide is getting thrown around in a pretty inappropriate way by lots of different folks. Uh, What Hamas wants, make no mistake about it, is genocide. They want to wipe Israel off the map. They've said so publicly, more than one occasion, in fact, just recently. And they've said that they're not going to stop. What happened on the 7th of October is going to happen again and again and again. And what happened on the 7th of October? Murder, slaughter of innocent people in their homes or at a music festival. That's genocidal intentions. Yes, there are too many civilian casualties in Gaza. Yes, the numbers are too high. Yes, too many families are grieving. And yes, we continue to urge the Israelis to be as careful and cautious as possible. That's not going to stop from the president right on down. But Israel is not trying to wipe the Palestinian people off the map. Israel's not trying to wipe Gaza off the map. Israel's trying to defend itself against a genocidal terrorist threat. So when we're going to start, if we're going to start using that word, fine, let's use it appropriately. John Kirby, spokesperson for the White House and National Security Council, today in the White House briefing room. NBC News writes that heavy fighting has erupted around Indonesian hospital in northern Gaza as Israel's military expands its ground assault on the Palestinian enclave. And the reports from the Indonesian hospital come after weeks of focus on Gaza's main medical facility, Al-Shifa, where hundreds of patients and staff remain trapped, more than two dozen Babies who were evacuated yesterday from al-Shifa are now at hospitals in Egypt for treatment. And Israel released videos that it said showed Hamas hostages and a tunnel at al-Shifa. As the fate of Gaza's hospitals continue to be a focus of the war's dueling narratives amid growing outrage at the plight of civilians under the Israeli assault. That's how NBC News summarized the headlines today. And Washington Today continues in a moment. People often think C-SPAN is funded by the federal government. In fact, we're a nonprofit organization that receives no government funding. As news consumption changes, you can help ensure the future of C-SPAN's unfiltered coverage of national government and politics. We hope you'll consider making a tax-deductible contribution that will support our daily editorial operations. To learn more, visit cspan.org forward slash donate. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you get your podcasts. And now back to the White House turkey pardon, which some say goes back to President Abraham Lincoln, whose son asked that he let a pet turkey live instead of being eaten for Thanksgiving dinner. CNN writes that the first documented turkey pardon was given by John F. Kennedy in 1963, though it didn't catch on right away. 
Even though Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon, neither one of them decided to pardon any turkeys as president. Turkey pardoning became the norm in 1989 when George H.W. Bush revived the tradition, now a staple of the White House holiday season. That was from CNN. The two turkeys this year are a pair of 42-pound birds named Liberty and Bell, raised in a barn by Jenny O in Wilmar, Minnesota. And another tradition, they spend the night before the pardon in the fancy Willard Hotel, not far from the White House. The National Turkey Federation president, Steve Lichen, yesterday at a news conference, explained how they were getting ready for their big day. So Liberty and Bell were hatched as part of the presidential flock back in July. Uh, they were raised like all of our turkeys, protected, of course, from weather extremes and, and predators in a barn, free to walk about with constant access to water and feed. In addition, uh, they were further prepared to be in the spotlight, as you can imagine, opportunities like this that they're not used to, with lots of people around and cameras clicking. Uh, they listen to all kinds of music to get ready for the crowds and people along the way. I can confirm they are, in fact, Swifties, and they do enjoy some prints. Liberty and Bell were also featured at the Minnesota State Fair in August, where Minnesotans got the chance to meet the turkeys virtually and submit name suggestions at the Minnesota Turkey Grower Association's booth. And after the red carpet welcome by the Willard yesterday and meeting all of you today, I think they are absolutely ready for prime time. Steve Lichen is president of the National Turkey Federation News Conference on Sunday. And today at the White House, President Biden issued those pardons. So I'm told by the Turkey Federation of Liberty Bell and uh, Liberty and Bell. They love Honeycrisp apples. Not bad, huh? Ice hockey. I sure in hell would like to see them play ice hockey. A thousand Lakes and the Mall of America. <laughs> now, just to get here, Liberty and Bell had to beat some tough odds in competition. They had to work hard to show patience and be willing to travel over a thousand miles. You could say even this harder than getting a, a ticket to the Renaissance tour or 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 Rip Britney's tour. She's down in it's kind of warm in Brazil right now. Look, folks, based on their commitment to being productive members of the society as they head to their new home at the University of Minnesota, I gonna bring them on up or do I do it there? That's a big bird, man. I'm impressed. I hereby pardon Liberty and Bell. All right. Congratulations, birds. Congratulations. Look, now let me conclude on a serious note about why we have Thanksgiving in the first place, to remind ourselves, and we sometimes forget this, how we have so much to be thankful for as a nation. This week, we'll gather with the people we love and the traditions that each of us have built up on our own families. We'll also think about the loved ones we lost, including just yesterday when we lost former First Lady Rosalind Carter, who walked her own path, inspiring a nation and the world along the way. And let's remind ourselves that we're blessed to live in the greatest nation on this face of the earth. President Biden at the White House. And with those pardons, the two turkeys, Liberty and Bell, are heading home, retiring at the University of Minnesota College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resources Sciences. President Biden plans to have Thanksgiving dinner with his family on Nantucket Island, Massachusetts, a long family tradition. Another holiday tradition at the White House today, on a horse-drawn cart. First Lady Jill Biden receiving the this year's White House Christmas tree. Clydesdale horses with Christmas tree ornaments and green-white ribbons braided into their hair. Jingle bells on their bridles, the drivers in top hats and black tuxedos. And First Lady Jill Biden made some remarks. I just want to say, well, early Merry Christmas, Happy Thanksgiving. Um, I hope you saw all, all our military families. It was so nice of them to join us today, all the children. Um, 
and the tree, which is magnificent, is from the uh, Klein Church Nursery. And uh, some of the kids said that they had never seen a tree so big. So I hope you'll all come back during the holidays with your families and join us and come see the tree when it's decorated. So thank you. Thanks for being here. Happy holidays. First Lady Jill Biden in the White House driveway that Nursery Klein Church is in Fleetwood, North Carolina, and the 18 and a half foot Fraser fir will be put up in the White House Blue Room as the White House Christmas tree. First Lady Jill Biden and other former First Ladies and former presidents are remembering former First Lady Rosalind Carter, who died on Sunday at the age of 96. Jill Biden posting, First Lady Rosalind Carter walked her own path, inspiring a nation and the world along the way. My love is with the entire Carter family as they and we grieve our dearest Rosalind. Former First Lady Michelle Obama writing, guided by her abiding faith and her commitment to service, Mrs. Carter used her platform in profoundly meaningful ways. Former President George W. Bush and former First Lady Laura Bush with this statement, there was no greater advocate of President Carter and their partnership set a wonderful example of loyalty and fidelity. She leaves behind an important legacy in her work to destigmatize mental health. There are also statements of praise from former President Bill Clinton and former First Lady Hillary Clinton and former President Donald Trump and former First Lady Melania Trump. C-SPAN interviewed Rosalind Carter in 2013, and we asked about that focus on mental health. I got upset with the press, too, because they covered my mental health work, the first few uh, meetings I had. And then they never showed up anymore. And one of the things I wanted to do is bring attention to the issue and how terrible it was and what um, few services there were. And, uh, but, and thinking just getting it out in the public. That's what I did in Georgia, develop, developed a good program in Georgia, by the way. Um, but they just didn't come. And so one day I was walking in the down floor, downstairs floor in the White House and met this um, woman who was one of the press people. And I said, you, you don't ever cover my, nobody ever covers my meetings in the, in the. she said, Ms. Carter, mental health is just not a sexy issue. <laughs> and that was, and that I didn't like, but I never did get very, very much coverage for it. But we toured the country, found out what was needed, developed uh, legislation, and uh, passed the Mental Health Systems Act of 1980. Um, it passed through Congress um, one month before Jimmy, as he says, was um, involuntarily retired from the White House, and the incoming president put it on his shelf, never implemented it. It was one of the greatest disappointments of my life. And now we had a mental health symposium here at the Carter Center. I have a great mental health program here last week. <clears throat> and one of the people who worked with me in the White House, the, the program, the subject was the Affordable Care Act. And he did a comparison of what we did in 1980 with what, we, what the Affordable Care Act. It is almost identical. We just passed parity. Um, it was announced here, the final regulations. I had parity in the 1980 system, Mental Health Systems Act. I mean, it's, it's really, things don't move very fast in the mental health field. <laughs> but I'm so thrilled now that we have parity and that we have the um, Affordable Care Act um, covers um, parity. And we also had integration in the 1980 legislation uh, combining mental health and substance use, behavioral health. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter interviewed by C-SPAN in 2013. She died on Sunday at the age of 96, just a few days after entering hospice care. Former President Jimmy Carter, who is 99 years old and also in hospice care, putting out a statement, Rosalind was my equal partner in everything I ever accomplished. She gave me wise guidance and encouragement when I needed it. As long as Rosalind was in the world, I always knew somebody loved and supported me. Rosalind Carter's funeral will be next week in Plains, Georgia. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's free evening newsletter word for word and get the stories making headlines in Washington emailed to you every day. Subscribe at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night.